So let us start by uh, asking our friend Chris Nineham to give us few uh, of a few few ideas of it, of his thought on the subject. So we welcome you here, and thank you for coming. I'd like to say um, thank you to the Bahrain Opposition Bloc for for organising um, this event, but also to bring um, solidarity from the Stop the War Coalition. Uh, on this day, which is obviously a difficult day uh, for Bahraini activists, um, a day of remembering the dead who've struggled for uh, civil rights and for liberation and freedom in Bahrain. I think it's also difficult times for everyone uh, in Britain at the moment because we have suffered clearly a major setback. Uh, everyone on the left and in the kind of social movements is feeling a little bit sore at the moment, um, to put it mildly. Um, and it's been a defeat that obviously will um, be quite costly on a number of different fronts. But I think one thing that we need to be clear about is that it will be fairly disastrous on the uh, front of British foreign policy. I mean, we know that uh, the Labour Party still has a leader who is... Um, <coughs> historically unmatched in terms of his opposition to foreign wars, foreign interventions, the general sort of um, neo-colonial project that Britain is unfortunately involved in. And that's a very serious loss and I do think it's going to mean um, that uh, our foreign policy is going to become, if anything, more aggressive and more dangerous yeah. in the months and years to come. And it's already pretty bad, let's face facts. Um, the record over the last 20 years has been diabolical, but not just um, on the question of the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq and Syria and Libya and so forth, but more generally, and I think Britain's relationship with Bahrain encapsulates, unfortunately, the kind of uh, toxic um, relationships and alliances and orientation that British foreign policy is involved in. Um, we saw in 2011, at the time of the democracy uprising in Bahrain, that the British government essentially sanctioned and backed the clampdown that led to the death of at least 30 uh, activists at that time and was a very important moment in the um, suppression of the, uh, of the Arab Spring, so-called, and the <coughs> democracy revolutions. And yet the British government were fully on board with that operation, and very publicly so. We've seen uh, clearly the British have built a new base and opened a new military base in Bahrain. Um, clearly that's kind of strengthened what was an already very intimate relationship with the Bahraini um, ruling class and establishment. We've seen closer and closer diplomatic and political ties between the British government and the Bahraini um, regime just at a time when uh, the human rights record of the regime has been so diabolical and worsening, it seems to me, year by year. Uh, obviously, we had the atrocities in 2011, but since then, as everyone in the room, I guess, knows, mm -hmm. um, there, have been, uh, uh, there has been a kind of increasing, developing clampdown on dissidents, on opposition uh, leaders and activists. As I understand it, more than 700 activists have had their citizenship revoked uh, in Bahrain since 2012. Uh, there's an ongoing operation to um, uh, expel uh, oppositionists from the country. There is the reintroduction of the death penalty. On a whole number of fronts, it is absolutely clear that the Bahraini government is involved in a very, very high level of organised repression against anyone who dares to discuss democracy in that country. And yet, and yet, the British government continues, if anything, increases its intimate relationship uh, with the regime. This is an utter disgrace. Um, it is something to be condemned. It is something to be campaigned against. But it's also, um, as I suggested, it's also a kind of uh, a totem, a kind of symbol of the sort of foreign policy that is being pursued uh, by this country, kind of outside of any real political open discussion or accountability or um, uh, 
uh, uh, popular debate. This is something that is going on largely behind the scenes in terms of British politics, but nevertheless, it's, um, it's extremely damaging and dangerous. Um, I think there's a number of reasons for it. I think partly there's a, a long and historic traditional relationship between the British establishment and the Bahraini <coughs> ruling class, which involves intimate relationships between the two royal families, amongst other things. I think it's also um, that Britain has important economic interests in terms of its trading relationship with Bahrain. But most importantly, this is, I think, about geopolitics. This is about strategy. This is about the overarching foreign policy that Britain is involved uh, in. And particularly, it's about Britain's um, unmatched, uh, second to none, unquestioning support for Donald Trump's uh, and America's foreign policy initiatives in the Middle East. And as, again, people by and large will know, what is going on here is that the Americans are trying to uh, once again intervene in the Middle East, but this time by forging an alliance between Saudi Arabia, some of the other Gulf states uh, and Israel, uh, and getting on board anyone they can from the West in uh, a, a kind of war of attrition against Iran and against Iran's influence uh, in the region. And this is, this is really how the West is trying to re-establish its control <coughs> Uh, of the Middle East, and Britain is not just complicit in it, Britain is essentially the Americans' main number one booster in this operation, and unfortunately, the election result that we've just all suffered is going to make uh, <coughs> what is already um, strong support for the Americans' uh, approach to the Middle East into something more enthusiastic and, and more... Um, uh, and more worrying and, and, and even closer. Uh, and I think, you know, this, this inevitable really strengthening of the relationship between Washington and Whitehall is definitely going to be one of the uh, results of, the, uh, of the, um, the general election. And it's one of the reasons why we have to redouble our efforts to build in this country opposition to the kind of foreign policy we've had over the last nearly 20 years. Um, and and really try and challenge that special relationship because it's a very, very dangerous relationship that uh, can only bring more uh, suffering and misery uh, to millions of people around the world. And I think I'll just end on a note of um, uh, kind of um, considered optimism, which is that the fact of the matter is there are millions and millions of people in this country, uh, probably the majority, in fact, undoubtedly the majority, who oppose the kind of wars of aggression that we've been involved in, who oppose military intervention, who think that what happened in Afghanistan and Iraq and, and, and the foreign policy that's been pursued since, the arming of Saudi Arabia, the support for the war on Yemen, who think that all of these things are wrong and damaging and need to be uh, changed. And we will, as the Stop the War Coalition, alongside other organisations, redouble our efforts to mobilise that opinion to um, strengthen the movement against war and to make sure that even though we've suffered a bad election defeat, that actually we move forward to challenging and ultimately changing the terrible foreign policy that our governments have been pursuing over the last two decades.